What if I told you a rugby ball could be an invaluable clinical tool? Surprised? Well, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that the bedrock of high quality patient care was compassion. In healthcare, this is just as true whether you're a clinician, a manager, or you work in finance. Now, every working environment is unique. Each comes with its own set of challenges. The most challenging area that I work is 21 miles off the UK coast in northern France. I'm a volunteer. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the media coverage of refugees making perilous journeys across sea and land in search of safety and a better life. Many travel thousands of miles on foot with few possessions. Many risk their lives by piling high onto overfilled boats, resulting in thousands sadly drowning each year. And for those that make it to the shores of Europe, some arrive in poor health, and others are so exhausted they can barely walk. So I, like you, was distressed when I saw these images on my TV screen, but I wasn't sure if there was anything I could do to help. Then I saw a Facebook post, and that post was calling for support for the people who were gathering in northern France at that point in time, in an area that became known as the jungle. So initially, I volunteered at weekends in the UK, packing and sorting donations. But it wasn't that long before I was out in France itself, when I had some time off from my NHS job as a nurse. I joined other volunteers from all around the world and we provided basic care from three rusty caravans inside the jungle. Now, none of us were professionally registered in France, so the type of care we provided was first aid only. Then in October 2016, everything changed. The jungle was demolished and the 10,000 people living there including 1,200 unaccompanied children, were dispersed to official centres throughout France. So now, we're nearly two years on. The camp has gone, the media coverage has gone, and yet there's estimated to be over 1,000 refugees living rough on the streets of Calais, and a further 700 in Dunkirk. Myself and other healthcare volunteers continue to provide support, but as there's no structured support system available, we provide basic first aid from the boot of our car in areas where the refugees gather, so old car parks and areas of wasteland. And our dental colleagues who go out there to volunteer, they are known to provide basic dental treatment from a camping chair in the mud. So the types of health issues that we come across are those that you commonly see in a GP practice in the UK. So the more common ailments anyway. Coughs, colds, sore throats. And often all that's needed is a packet of tissues, a bracelet that we make out of tubing net, sprinkled with old bass oil and a bit of kindness. So these people really have nothing. But we also see lots of cases of trench foot, dehydration, dirty wounds that need dressing, and the myriad of, of health problems that are a result of living rough and walking endlessly for days. So we also see more serious health problems sometimes, and for those we refer the person on to the local hospital. So let me tell you about a 15-year-old that I met. He travelled 3,000 miles alone from Sudan. His only possessions were those that he stood up in, and his most favourite were a pair of colourful baseball boots, which he thought were the bee's knees. The trouble was, they were several sizes too small, and they'd rubbed his feet so raw that an infected wound on one of his feet was tracking up his leg. Now, it was a hot day, <coughs> yet he was pale, he was shivery, and his heart was racing. He was clearly septic 
and needed urgent hospital admission. So after several days of intravenous antibiotics, he was much better and he was discharged from hospital. But what I need to remind you is that he's 15 years old. He's an unaccompanied minor. And right now, there's thought to be 140 unaccompanied children in Calais. So we also see people with mental health issues, such as PTSD, depression. We see a significant amount of self-harm, and we hear stories of suicide. I'll never forget one young man that I met. He'd just been discharged from hospital. He'd had a head injury, and he had a huge gash in his head that had been sutured. His hair was still caked in old blood. Now, it was pouring with rain, and he'd taken shelter under a concrete ledge in a park. He was so distressed, he couldn't talk. All he could do was cry. And all I could do was be with him and show him that I cared. So as a nurse, I have a toolkit of clinical skills. But no matter the situation, the most valuable component of care that any of us can offer is compassion. And that's just as relevant whether we're working with refugees or whether we're working here in the NHS. So let's get back to that rugby ball. So refugees are often frightened and distrustful of anyone they perceive to be in a position of authority. <coughs> so we introduced ball games to try and break down those barriers. And it was through the rugby ball that a young Eritrean lad was able to tell us about a skin complaint that he'd been suffering with for several weeks. So on a closer look, he had scabies. And scabies is highly contagious. So it's through the rugby ball that we were able to give him the right treatment and a fresh set of donated clothes. Even when we create a sense or an environment of trust, communication can still be difficult. And that's partly due to language barriers, but it's often more complex. We often have interpreters available, but they are from the same community as the refugees. So as you can imagine, not everybody wants to disclose personal information in front of someone that they know. And an example of that was when I met somebody from Kurdistan. And he was too embarrassed to talk in front of his friend. And not surprisingly, really, because who would necessarily want to share all of their medical information with somebody else? So him and I stood aside from everyone else and used Google Translate to try and have a conversation. <coughs> and his problem was that he was suffering with rectal bleeding. So I was able to refer him on to the hospital clinic so he could be reviewed properly. Now, back in the east end of London where I work, caring for refugees and other vulnerable groups can present with the same issues in communication and trust. For the UK's 120,000 um, refugees, and that just re represents 0.24% of our entire population, many will not know how to navigate institutions like the NHS. <coughs> and for some, it will be their first experience of free health care. Now, asylum seekers receive just £5.28 per day. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I would struggle to live on that amount of money. Whilst their asylum claim is going through, they're not allowed to work, so they can't earn more money. So just imagine if you and I went into a high street coffee shop, what could we buy for £5.28? A regular latte and a slice of cake, maybe? So as healthcare professionals, it's important for us to know and understand the socioeconomic needs of our patients. Because let's face it, some of them may not be able to afford to attend the hospital appointments that we send them for. Now, while my work in the NHS and um, with refugees complement each other, it is without a doubt that I've brought back more to the NHS than I've taken out to Calais with me. I think I'm a better nurse because of working in such unpredictable, challenging environments with little or no resource. There are parallels between the roles, and the parallels come with the, with the form of communication. In my role in the NHS, I deal a lot with complaints, and complaints are often a breakdown in communication and trust between the healthcare practitioner and the patient. 
So working with refugees has shone a spotlight back on my practice here in, here in the UK and has really reinforced the importance of communication, of trust, and also of providing a compassionate service to all of our patients. As a senior nurse and a role model within the NHS, I encourage the nurses and the other staff that I work with to bring more com compassion to the care that we deliver. Now, since I've been going out to, the, to Calais, my friends, family and colleagues have started going out there too. And my daughter Freya, who's on a flying visit <laughs> up there in the audience, has been spending her whole three months off university working for an organisation called Help Refugees. So what I'd say to you is that volunteering is a really valuable experience. But if you're going to do it, be prepared to step outside of your comfort zone because you'll learn so much more. Compassionate care is not just about what we do, what we say or how we say it. Compassionate care can be many things. And sometimes it's about giving someone a new set of clothes. Sometimes it's just about being there. And sometimes it's about throwing someone a rugby ball. Thank you.